Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post-production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. And I am really excited. Today, I have with me Gina Chain. Gina is the author of Murder in the Cards, second in the Seams Detective Agency series. I'm coming to you from New York, and Gina is coming to you from West Sussex in England. Gina, welcome. Thank you very much, Becky. And it's fantastic to be here doing this. It's quite exciting because I've never done one before. So Ah. it's a bit of a learning experience as well. Ah, beautiful. That will be going to be loads of fun. I'm sure of that. I would love to start off just hearing a little bit more about you and your writing. And I understand that you worked as a pilot for some 35 years flying yes. not just airplanes, but helicopters and small aircraft and yeah. and also have traveled a lot for your work. So tell us a little bit more about that. And, and also, how has that helped or impacted your writing? Right. Well, actually, my writing and my flying go very much hand in hand. Mm-hmm. Because although this is a new series that I started last year, well, I started really under lockdown, but it, the first book came out last year. I have always been writing. And for many years, I used to edit a helicopter magazine called Helicopter Life. Oh. Which is, <laughs> yes, exactly. It's, um, it's all to do with anything to do with helicopters, and it's for both trade and enthusiasts. And of course, for me, it's particularly interesting because for the last 35 years or even a bit more, I have been flying helicopters professionally. And I've been teaching helicopter flying, but also small aeroplanes, small aircraft. And this is kind of relevant in this particular series because one of the three detectives is actually herself an airline pilot. And she owns a tiger moth. She was given it by a friend, just a piece of luck there for her. (laughs) Because obviously um, not everyone owns a tiger moth, even if they are airline pilots. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, but it does mean that I'm able to use quite a lot of my own experience of flying tiger moths, because flying tiger moths I've been doing for years and years and years. And in case anyone doesn't know, that's um, it's a, a Second World War biplane, and they are quite common in this country. There are quite a few of them. And as far as being well-known, I suppose they're about as well-known as the Spitfire. So um, there's, there's quite a lot in that side. But anyway, so the, the flying experience comes a lot into the writing and the traveling also comes a lot because perhaps because Russian is a small island, we've, I spent a lot of time doing um, flights elsewhere, including ah, yeah. flying to Moscow for a games. It was um, it's called the World Helicopter, the World, the World Helicopter Championships. And we flew to Moscow for that and various other places. I worked in Jerez in the south of Spain and in America. So lots of lots of different places. So I'm able to draw on all that experience in my writing. Cool. Now you've piqued my curiosity about the helicopter games. Are you like doing stunts and that sort of thing? Very that- much. Yes. It's, it's supposed to be, it was actually started as a way of improving the flying standard of early helicopter pilots. Because I think it was, it kind of, helicopters kind of evolved from planes, as you know, but of course they're much more useful in a lot of ways. But the, I think the standard of some of the pilots probably was quite low in the beginning. So they started these games to try and improve the actual standards. And some of them are quite strange. And some of them include holding a bucket out the door and going through a load of gates, which are actually poles, without spilling water in the bucket, and then ending up putting the bucket on a, on a table without spilling in water. And you're measured on how much water you spill and how much time you take and whether you go through the gates correctly. So it's very much like a sort of, it's a knockout type program yeah. or, or even actually a bit like um, Harry's Games. I've forgotten what they're called. Uh, what they're called? Anyway, they're, but those, yeah. those sort of games. Yeah, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very much that sort of thing. And right. But they do also include precision flying where you've got one chain that's supposed to go on the ground, one that isn't, and you fly around a course and navigation 
which is always very interesting. And Moscow, we got completely lost and saw got within sight of uh, Red Square, which was um, kind of interesting. Oh. So uh, luckily, this was back in the 90s when people weren't quite so fussy and worried about what was going on. Yeah. And yes, yeah, so, so basically, it's, it's um, a test of all across the board, various different things that all pilots do. And it's a lot of fun, of course. Yeah. Wow. Really interesting. Uh, I'm going to pivot just a little bit here, but obviously all of this impacts, I mean, all of who we are and all of our experience impacts our writing. I would love to hear a little bit more about your choice to have more than one lead detective. Because oh, yes. typically, you know, in a, in a mystery, we have one lead detective, often a sidekick. Now, you've taken a different approach. So tell I us have, about that. Yeah, I have three female detectives. And the reason that I have them is because I think in real life, women usually work in collusion. Oh, they tend to talk to each other about things. Whereas in, may I de- dare I say, a male-dominated <laughs> world, men tend to like to be in charge of everything and just have someone beside. And quite often they like to have a female sidekick, but mm-hmm. actually have the man in charge. In fact, in reality, women discuss most subjects not with everybody, but just with three close friends or two close friends. And that's what these do. So every time they come across a clue, they they put it around the three of them. They discuss it. They see how, how it work out. And they have very different abilities. And Miranda, who is sort of with young mother with young children, she's very intuitive. She feels when things aren't right, but she can't always tell you why. Mm-hmm. Kat is much more intellectual. She is um, the linguist and she although she had a a kind of checkered background because she married at 19 and so she has grown-up children but she is is the one that keeps them sort of straight level and she can be a bit bossy she can be a bit of a tiger mother in fact one of the um one of the reviews described her as a tiger mother but Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's not her (laughs) no she's not just happy like that she also has a very nice side and then the third detective is the one who does all the internet she's much younger than the other two And she is the pilot. She's an airline pilot. And she's only a first officer at the moment, so she's in her 20s. And she does all the internet stuff for them because the others, being a little bit older, aren't quite as good on the internet as the younger woman, as as tends to happen in real life. So I've tried to keep it, although it's on the side of a cosy mystery, sort of whodunit rather than completely cosy, I've tried to make it as close to real life as possible, uh, given that in a mystery, you're never quite close to real life, right. unless you're very Yeah, well. I, I, I love the, how you've done this with the three, because it seems like you've opened up a lot more conversation, dialogue potential by having that uh, collaborative approach in their solving of the mysteries. This is true. There, there is a lot of dialogue. And Sometimes I wonder whether there is too much dialogue and sometimes I have to go away from dialogue and do a bit less dialogue because hmm. it, it is tempting, of course, to do that. I mean, I do know that one of the Maygray novels came out completely in dialogue, perhaps because George Simenon was just trying out a way of doing it because yeah. uh, mostly he doesn't, mostly he describes the part of Paris and so forth. Right. But um, in in this one, there there is quite a lot of dialogue, but at the same time, they do a lot of things as well because dialogue can become a little boring to people, I know, but hmm. it also can be quite interesting with the to and fro and the interplay of the three girls. So, yeah, you know, well, it, I it, think, it swings around about. <laughs> yeah, I think often there's a, often a shortage of dialogue because, I, you know, we live in a, in a very dialogue driven. I mean, that's how kind of how we live our it lives. Is, I mean, yes. So, no, that's um, true. Communication is very yeah. important. Yeah. Yes. And how we do that. Yes, absolutely. So, yes, this is just another way perhaps of looking into um, how a mystery can be formed. Yeah. And uh, and I do think also, you know, doing really good dialogue is quite a sort of an advanced skill, you know, dialogue that yes. that sounds the way people really talk. I think, And I think you've done a beautiful job with that. It is quite interesting, actually. I, I In the early days, I liked to go into um, cafes and things. And yeah. particularly as I was traveling on my own for work, I was quite often on my own. So... You tend to be listening to other people. Right. And it is very interesting listening to people because, of course, they don't speak uh, the way we do in books. We tend to be much more aware of grammar and so forth in books. But mm-hmm. they, they generally are pretty ungrammatical. And they, they use all sorts of terms for each other that um, in a book you'd think, oh, I'd be a little bit careful saying that or <laughs> someone <laughs> would disapprove of that one. But, right. but it is interesting to listen to people. Yeah. And, and funny enough, it was, I think, perhaps because of 
my interest in how communication works that I put in the bit about Polari. Polari is a, an underworld uh, language that was used in the gay community before 1967 when it was uh, when it was illegal to be gay. And my um, people, my book Murder in the Cults starts in 1963, so it was when people it was still illegal to be gay, and so a lot of people were still using that language of Polari and to, to communicate and say things. Now, in fact, my villains use it in a different way. They use it to cheat at games because <laughs> since theirs is a secret language, they're able to play bridge and then give each other signals that other people don't know about. And so they can make a lot of money in all the clubs going around playing cards when um, other people can't. So that's, uh, well, other people don't know what they're saying. So it's um, quite an interesting yeah. Interesting way of using it. Was the use of Polari integral in the beginning as you were first thinking of the story? Because it's used so, you know, it's a, it's such a key element, it seems. Yes, I think it probably was. Um, when I started writing Murder in the Cards, I wanted to write something that was related to bridge. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to look at the areas around cross-dressing, around the difference between the 1960s and the era that we have now, and particularly as I wrote it, a lot of it under COVID, I wanted to write about the different restrictions in the 1960s, which seemed so free when you look back at it, mm -hmm. and the restrictions that we had under, under COVID, which everyone thinks was absolutely so uh, restrictive and so forth. But actually, if you look at the times in the 1960s, you can see that it was free for a certain sector of society, but for other sectors of society, it wasn't free at all. Right. So it, it, a lot of it depends where you're looking and what your particular perspective is. And in a, in a lot of my writing, I've wanted actually to cover perspectives and how mm. different people look at different things and how if you come from one standpoint you have a, a totally different judgment from people who come from another standpoint. Mm -hmm. And it's only when you are discussing, and we're back to communication again, when you're talking to other people, you realise that actually there are lots of different viewpoints if only you take the time to listen to other people and hear what their viewpoints and their perspectives are. Right, yeah. Oh, that's great. And uh, how did you first learn about Polari? <laughs> well, actually, funnily enough, because I was at a friend's house and he's gay, and he and his boyfriend, now husband, kept um, teasing each other in Polari. And I was saying, what is this? What is this about? What, what is this language you're talking? <laughs> and then he said, oh, don't worry, we're just teasing you, we use Polari. And I thought, really? I mean, this was only a few years ago. So <laughs> I thought, uh, hello. And he's, he's young, so, you know. Anyway, yeah. so then I started looking at it, and then I realised there was this thing round the horn that um, Kenneth Williams used to do. It, this is a very UK thing, so it may not be sort of known in America, but mm. he had a programme every Sunday night and he was actually it was when it was still illegal but he was sort of teasing it because he, he just made it a jolly funny program but he put in all these Polari words which people who were in the gay society would know and they go oh god this is this is a program actually about us but other people think it isn't uh -huh. so it was it, it was a rather clever rather subtle little game anyway I started looking at more and more Polari and I discovered that actually it's, it's a fascinating subject and it brings in a lot of cant phrases that because people were living like slightly in the underworld, they tended mm -hmm. to mix a lot with people who were also considered to be a bit below the, the radar and gypsies. Romanians mm -hmm. seemed to come in there a lot. A lot of, the, lot of things come from the Romanian language. There were a lot of people who came from the Caribbean. So there are all sorts of words that, oh, a lot of Irish words too, mm -hmm. that come into Polari and are used. And it's just because these were all people who were able to communicate using the Cant language, the sort of, as it were, the pidgin of uh -huh. UK, which is kind of, I mean, we all know about pigeon being there in other countries like Caribbean and Africa right. and so forth, but, but no, actually the UK had its own pigeon language. So, and that was Polari. So, yeah. well, this is my theory anyway. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that is so interesting. So where do you come up with your stories? How do ideas come to you? Are you cognizant of those sort of, do you have patterns of inspiration or? Quite honestly, they can come anywhere. Yeah. Sometimes I'll be talking to someone and they'll say something strange. Uh, oh, for example, in the first one, The Mystery of the Lost Husbands, mm -hmm. I was talking to a builder who'd done um, our extension in our house. And uh, he said that a friend of his was had stopped working or was closing his company because 
he'd been a partner with his brother and his brother had married someone who'd already been married four times. And he said, and of course, my brother died and was intested. And so the woman decided that she was going to have half the company and did. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> so the builder was down to a very small company and to, to pay her what uh, she deserved, he had to actually sell off quite a lot of his own houses and so forth and so on. So um, it was quite a, a thought that. And I thought, oh, well, what happens if a friend of yours was going to marry someone who'd been married five times? I didn't know. In her case, I don't think the, the other previous ones had died. But I was thinking, well, what happens if the widow of your brother was actually about to marry someone else and all her previous husbands had died, wouldn't you be really suspicious? Wouldn't you wonder what the <laughs> hell was going on? So uh, wouldn't you want to get an, an agency in to investigate and find out, did yes. she actually kill them or was she just unlucky? You know? yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so, I can so that, see that. that's what started that. And ideas can come in any way like that. I'm, uh, I'm trying to think of where else I, I get ideas from, but but, you know, it can just simply be a, I'm playing a game of cards and my husband shouts, could you have been so stupid as to do that? And I think, oh, I must write something about cards and how <laughs> people kill their husbands when they shout at them. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> because That's great. that actually, in, in Murder in the Cards, was also a little thing that they used there. Because in the 1920s, there was a real story of a woman, a couple called Bennett, and they were playing bridge and she was dummy and he was playing the hand and he made a mistake and didn't didn't make it. And she came back from the kitchen where she'd been doing something else and realised and said, oh, you could have made that. So he was so angry that he slapped her. She rushed out to the bedroom and got his gun and shot him dead. <sighs> the interesting thing there was that she was acquitted and got the insurance money. <laughs> so obviously the, uh, the judge was... Uh, the very sympathetic a player. Uh, <laughs> probably a bridge player. Him. Who knows? <laughs> you know, somewhere along the line, there was um, a lot of understanding of uh, of this problem. Yeah, uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Is there any particular significance to the title, or if not, you know, how did you come up with it? Well, the Seams Detective Agency, the, the series title, uh, both that and the title of this particular. Oh uh, right, book, okay. Well, the Seams Detective Hearts. Agency is because yeah. they're they're women, and it's S E E capital M S, so they're Ms, but they also see things that other people don't, and the Seams part of it is because things often seem to be true when they're actually not. I mean, how often do we think one thing is true and then discover when we know it better that actually it's not true? Yes. So that's that the time. The, <laughs> that is the series, yes, quite all the time. <laughs> so that that's that. The mystery of the lost husbands came from, as you'd expect, because it was a mystery about lost husbands. Yeah. Murder in the Clouds came because it's about cards and also it reflects back on the original 1920s story, but that's used by the people in the book as a metaphor because they all play a lot of bridge. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of see it that way. And then people start being murdered, but not yeah. by cards, but while they're right. playing cards and the, the hero or what the first um, victim actually disappears while playing bridge. They're playing online and he dies while he's playing bridge. So, I mean, that's as extraordinary as they come. How can that be? Can a dead man play bridge? He continues to play bridge after he was dead, apparently. <laughs> How did so, he do it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So how did he do that? Yeah, so, yes. yeah. so that's where that... And the, then the third one, which hasn't come out yet, but I think you've got a little start of it yet, so is wild garlic. And it's because we've got a lot of wild garlic here. And the smell can send some people absolutely mad. And I was thinking, hmm. would that smell actually get to you so much that you'd end up killing the owner so that you could get rid of all the garlic? <laughs> and that's sort of that's how that's and I thought that was quite a nice title, um, yeah. Wild Garlic. So that's how that the sort of the names of the books come in. Yeah. Do you find that titles just sort of come to you as I mean, they obviously they make sense, but do you struggle at all with with titles? On the first three, I haven't, but mm -hmm. I'm starting to write the fourth book and I cannot think of a title for it. So, yes. okay. so, <laughs> so we'll it can it. be, yes, <laughs> it maybe they have to use the title twice. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got like the second. Right, <laughs> right. I mean, um, I know that some people do appear to have a sort of series name. One will be Murder in the, and the next one will be Murder on the, and the next one will be Murder under the. So right. they're kind of using murder like it is a way of connecting all their books. Right, yeah. But yeah. no, I haven't done that. Yeah, I was just curious. So, and, and you've already partially answered with like what's coming up next for you. So tell us, uh, just uh, you told us about the wild garlic. Is that the third book in this series though? Uh, that's the third, yes. Yeah. 
And then you just mentioned that you're also starting on the fourth? I am because I've written the third and Mm -hmm. it's now being looked at by an editor. And there are certain things that I think that she's sort of highlighting that perhaps need to be a little tweaked. But so I'm still doing a bit on that. And then I'm starting the fourth one, which is actually in almost in a series. It's it's got the same, without giving too much away, it's a bit tricky not to, but it's got the same villainess in, yeah. in both, in the third and fourth one. So there's an element of, of the third going over into the fourth. So it's sort of, it runs on quite nicely for me. So it's not as hard as starting a whole new thing mm-hmm. so yeah. where you have to start because... Here she's kind of well. Anyway, take it from me. She she's got to be she's got to be discovered. She's she's. We know that she's done something wrong, but we haven't got her yet. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Let's take a short pause, and we'll be right back. Ever think audiobooks deserve more recognition? So do we. At the Audiobook World Awards Academy, we are aiming to become the world leader in building awareness in the audiobook industry and thus promoting a happier and more conscious life. We've designed a points-based ranking system, meaning you can vote for your favorite audiobook titles ahead of our big awards night in August 2023. To register your free account and find out more information, visit awa.academy. Okay, so let's talk now a little bit about the audiobook production, that uh, part of the process for you. What is it, or what was it about Melanie Crawley, your narrator, that led you to choose her to voice your book? I thought she read it really nicely. I mean, funny enough, it, it was quite hard to decide because there were a lot of people who read very nicely. And they all had something slightly different from the others. Yeah. Some read slightly faster, some read slightly slower, some were more quirky. I don't know, it's hard to say, but... Um, When I was listening to them all, and bear in mind, this is the first time I've ever done this process, so Mm -hmm. it was quite interesting for me to to see what it was like, and I didn't really know what to expect. But I found that that Melanie's, perhaps the way she spoke was more what I was expecting to hear, Mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but it, it it struck me that hers was very good, but... I have to say that, you know, you actually, I think, sent me 16 people or something like that, and they mm. were all incredibly good. Yeah. So it was really quite hard to tell yeah. which yeah. one would be best. Yeah. But your, your editor helped a lot there too, actually, sort of explaining what to look for and that some people prefer it being slightly slower. Sometimes it was a bit too fast. Mm-hmm. Things like that were, were helpful for me because I speak quite fast. And it is a problem, I think, with British people. They tend to speak quite fast anyway. Not fast as the Spanish or the Italians, but still <laughs> quite fast. And maybe that's difficult in an audiobook. I mean, it's not its not something that you know until you listen to enough audiobooks. Yeah. And of course, a lot of audiobooks are actually done by actors who are incredibly well-known, which means that you end up listening to the actor and thinking of the actor doing it, which right. isn't the same as an, an actor that you don't know, where you are you tend to be concentrating much more on the book rather mm-hmm. than, well, I would assume so. I mean, I'm not the reader, I'm the listener, but but I would yeah. assume that that would be more the case. Because certainly if I listen to, say, Stephen Fry talking, I'm thinking this is Stephen Fry doing it, right. rather right. than thinking, right. um, <laughs> that, you know, this is that this book is going on. So it's, it's you know, that was, that was part of the process too, the interest yeah. of that. Yeah. I, it's interesting that, you know, because uh, this year... I also launched a novel, and it's my first novel, and had a similar, you know, I'm very experienced in the audiobook industry, but I also had a hard time deciding because there were so many good ones uh, to choose from. And it was Isn't that interesting? Yes. Total differences, it, yeah. Although you're used to listening to it, you're listening to it from a different perspective. Right. So here yeah. we come up with these perspectives again. Because yeah. you're, you're, you're thinking about the diction and the clarity and so forth and so on. Yeah. And um, I'm just thinking of the story, really, whether it flows. So it, yeah. it's an interesting aspect that yeah. to get into, yes. Yeah. So what would you say, like, about the process of the producing of the audiobooks? Uh, is there anything in sort of part of the process that sort of stands out to you? 
that you... Yeah, I thought it was amazing, actually. The fact that, that everyone was so caring and that they were asking me every week, now, are you happy with this? Are you happy with that? This is how we've got to at the moment. This is what we're going to do. We'll do a bit more. I thought, wow, this is absolutely amazing. I wasn't expecting this level of care at all. I was oh. expecting, like, go on, take it and leave it. <laughs> but no, I was really impressed. It was really, really nice to have that sort of continuity and um, people um, just keeping you in knowing what's going on because it, it can be because it does take quite a long process obviously yeah. because it, it's it's um, recorded and then it goes back to the editor and then it goes back to the speaker again and back to the editor and so forth and things are, are, are changed according to that and then you finally get to read it and listen to it and when I listened to it of course I thought wow this is amazing I don't hear anything wrong with this at all yeah, which yeah. perhaps I would have done if there'd been if I'd heard an earlier version who knows I mean I don't know because I didn't yeah. hear it but, uh, <laughs> but I thought it was very impressive and I Great. know having I did try and get some things like Amazon book up and they have a kind of speaker and for some reason I seem to always get someone with a Chinese accent I don't know why oh, I don't oh. know if that's that's probably because I was putting in the settings I probably put Chinese accent or something but I found it actually very um, difficult to listen to the ones that Amazon and Google and so forth sort of do automatically so I was quite glad to have a one that I could hear and and I loved it I thought, yeah. gosh, this is a great book. I wish I could. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not sort of It is great. I mean, you know, it sounds great. rather immodest, but it sounded so good. Yeah. It was really yeah. amazing. Great. Mm. So. Well, thank you. I would love to uh, let our listeners know, remind them of their your website address where they can learn more about you and your books. Would you like to tell them where? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, ginachain.com. And it has quite a lot of other things on it because obviously it's got the books on it. But I also have a blog, which occasionally I keep up. And it tells you about various things. I mean, I did actually win a prize for my communications in flying, which was kind of nice just for the magazine. And uh, there's a little interview there, which is uh, sort of an element of hilarious in a way. Oh, great. (laughs) Yes, I know. (laughs) And then sometimes I like to write little poems on there as well. And there's a short story that I wrote and a few other things. So the website is sort of broad in what it's got. It's meant to entertain. Of course, it's got lots of pictures of my dogs. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know whether that's a a good thing or a bad thing, but it certainly (laughs) are. They are there. (laughs) Oh, that's great. Great. Well, thank you so much. Again, this is Gina Chain, author of Murder. Murder in the Cards, the second in the Seams Detective Agency series. Thank you so much for being with me today. No, thank you so much for doing it. It's absolutely marvelous and great fun. Great. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at ProAudioVoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us, and please join us next week. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.